Hi, I'm Ron Matson, and welcome to Learn the Bible in 24 Hours with Dr. Chuck Missler. Chuck will be taking you through some interesting oversights of the Bible and showing you some amazing facts. For more information on how you can join this group, click here. Well, we're going to get into hour six of Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. And um, this is the session where they're in the land. We've been through the creation. We've been through the call of Abraham. We've, the call of the, they, they go down to Egypt as a family. They come out as a nation. They blow it at Kadesh Barnea, and they wander for 40 years. Now they're at the threshold. They're finally at, this, at the gate the second time. First time they blew it, the second time they're going to uh, do better. And interestingly enough, if you study the, uh, the summary of the Old Testament given by Stephen in Acts 7, it's very interesting to outline his sermon. They never let him finish, so you don't get, he doesn't get to his final point. But if you notice, his whole presentation was uh, Israel always blows it the first time, makes it on the second. Blows it on the first time, makes it on the second. M blew it up to Kadesh Barnea, get in. And he goes through. And of course, on Christ's first coming, they crucify him. He doesn't get to the second coming, but on the second coming, of course, they are going to petition him and come, it, 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 they're going to be fulfilled. And uh, people ask me, why is Israel the chosen people? Well, God chose them. And uh, it's clear that's what the whole Bible is all about. That's what the Old Testament sa is a story of a nation. And that nation brings forth a person. And the whole Bible is about that person, the person of Jesus Christ. The Creator Himself became man and dwelled among us. And that's what this is all about. But here we are in the land. And we're going to now be in the, uh, we've been through the Torah. We're now going to be in, in uh, the book of Joshua. And we're going to look at Judges and Ruth. Ruth occurs during the period of the Judges. And it's going to be the dessert of the evening. We'll get through this other stuff, but hang in there for Ruth. That's, it's, it's worth the whole trip. But of course, we're moving now from uh, Exodus time but, uh, up to the time of David. So Joshua enters the land, overcomes the land. And in there, we're going to have a little addenda. We'll talk about the sun standing still. A lot of Christians have a problem with this. Oh, I, Joshua, the Bible says the, the earth stopped rotating. No, it doesn't. It says there's a long day, and you can do that by changing the procession of the earth a bit. But uh, we'll get to that there, but it's going to be a surprise to many. Then he enters the land, overcomes the land, and then divides the land. That's what the book of Joshua is all about. Then we get to the generation that followed Joshua. Joshua did, did all in all a pretty good job. But his descendants really mess up. And uh, we have 450 years of doing what was right in their own eyes. Whatever that means, we'll get to that. Sinning, suffering, repentance, and deliverance is the pattern. Again and again, they sin, they suffer for it, they repent, a deliverer has come, gives them some relief. But then the whole cycle repeats again. And, but then in the, as a climax this period, we get to Ruth. And, uh, and, and this period that we're looking at is the bridge between the entering land and the monarchy which will follow, because after this will come uh, Samuel and so forth. But the book of Ruth is a lo love story that is even, even uh, celebrated in colleges as a piece of literature, quite apart from the Bible. It's often portrayed as one of the most elegant pieces of literature. But as you get into it, you're going to be, every line is full of surprises, and we'll get to there. Joshua, entering the land, he actually crosses the Jordan with his gang, and the first thing he does at Gilgal is a surprise. He circumcises the nation. It's a shock to realize, after all of that, they were uncircumcised. The first generation died away. The children, in large measure, weren't circumcised. These are Israelis. And uh, so they have a circumcision thing. It's also here where the manna ceases. Up till now, they've gotten the supernatural bread every day. That now stops, because they're now in the land, the land of milk and honey. But also, as they enter land, they get a very, very interesting night visitor that most people miss, and we'll get into that. And that's the first five chapters. Verses 6 through 12, they're going to overcome the land. And then they're going to occupy the land, and they'll enjoy the victory of faith. So, entering the land. They cross the Jordan. Joshua, among other things, makes a little mound of 12 stones. He actually does that twice, by the way. And this monument of 12 stones, many people miss. In the New Testament, in John chapter 1, John the Baptist is baptizing in the Jordan. In fact, in John 1, verse 28, it says, These things were done at Bethabara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The word Bethabara means the house of passage. John the Baptist is baptizing the very place that Joshua brings the people into the land. 
When you get to Matthew, it quotes John the Baptist saying something additional. It says, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. When people read that, they don't connect the dots. The stones he's probably pointing to are probably the very stones that Joshua set up, one stone for each of the twelve tribes. So you, you, it closes the loop for you if you follow me. Watch for those things as you study your Bible. It'll tie it together. And then, of course, you have the circumcision at Gilgal. Uh, the manna ceases then. And we have the strange visitor. Now, this visitor, I visualize this as, uh, as Joshua wandering around in the evening one night, and he encounters this guy with a sword drawn. And Joshua challenges him like a sentry. Are you for us or for our enemies? And the person there says, I am the captain of the Lord's host. Now, don't let that word throw you. When we hear captain, most of us in the military think of a field-grade officer. The word captain here means the top guy, the commander. The, 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 he's the commander of the Lord's hosts. And he's got a sword drawn. <laughs> and uh, he tells Joshua, take off your shoes, you're on hallowed ground. Well, First of all, you need to understand, when you read your Bible, you'll discover that angels do not allow themselves to be worshipped. Several times, uh, Daniel, John, wherever, they go to worship, see thou do it not. You with me? Angels do not allow themselves to be worshipped. There's one exception. That's an angel who got, because he allowed that, got into a lot of trouble. Got into, Satan will get there when the time comes. But angels do not allow themselves to be worshipped. This guy commands Joshua to worship him. In fact, uses a phrase that he knew Joshua would associate with what happened 40 years ago by the burning bush. Okay? And also on Mount Sinai, where Joshua was with Moses, by the way. Take off your shoes, you're on hallowed ground. So, obviously, Joshua connects the dots. This is the guy that's going to actually lead the, the battle the next morning of Jericho. Jericho, the, the, the nation Israel, um, is, is, is populated by... Um, Originally ten tribes, now seven. And that the most powerful of them were the Amorites. And the capital of the Amorites was Jericho. ben Yarar, which is the, uh, uh, the, it means the house of the moon god. House of the moon god. That's what Jericho means. Where is the capital of the PLO today? In Jericho. What's the symbol of Islam? The moon god. You'll, I'll, you'll, uh, kind of interesting, isn't it? The conquest of Canaan, conquest of Jericho, involves the failure at Ai, the Battle of Beth Horon, the division of land. We can't go through it all, obviously. I've taken just the highlights here. The conquest of Jericho, Bet Yarah, the house of the moon god. It's interesting, Joshua sends in two spies. Why didn't he send twelve like Moses did? Well, maybe there were ten of them were useless. The two were enough if you had the right ones, right? But did they bring back intelligence that based upon which he built his battle plan? I don't think so. I wouldn't call them spies. What did they accomplish? They got Rahab saved. Call them witnesses. So he sends in two spies. Okay, sheltered, and they're sheltered by Rahab. So I'm going to call these guys witnesses. You'll see why in a minute. Then the battle plan. They're going to go against the capital of the most powerful adversary. And here's his battle plan. We're going to march around the city once a day for six days, keeping silent. Then on the seventh day, we're going to march around seven times. And then after the seventh time, we're going to blow our trumpets and yell, and the wall's going to fall down. Really? I mean, can you visualize his general saying, uh, the boss is off his rocker. The lights are on, but no one's home. Well, what's going on here? That's the battle plan. And I don't know how he sold it to his troops, but he obviously did. And, uh, but he's also told, don't take any spoil. Don't take any accursed thing. And... Uh, and, and, of course, you know the story of, of Jericho. That's exactly what they do, right? And, 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 and uh, so it goes. You get the next one. The next challenge is Ai. By now, they're feeling their oats. They're feeling they're very, they got a lot of confidence in themselves. Big mistake. Don't have confidence in yourself. Always. And they underestimated the enemy. That Well, 3,000 guys should be enough for this one. And they get clobbered. They actually lose 36, but, and, of course, accomplish nothing. This is the only loss in their seven-year campaign, is it Ai? Why? Joshua prays. The Lord says unto Joshua, Get thee up! Why do you lie there on your face? <laughs> I love this. Do your homework, in other words. 
Turns out they, they found out that Achan, one of the guys, had smuggled some forbidden loot. He violated God's injunction. He broke the rules. And because of that, they failed. That's scary, by the way. God means what He says and says what He means, right? We need to learn that. So the sack of Ai follows. After stoning Achan and his family and his belongings, a second attack was undertaken. This time they take ten times as many people, 30,000 guys, with a 5,000 man ambush force, and they wipe out the city. Big success. There are lots of other battles up north, but the big, the watershed battle, the battle of midway, so to speak, of the, of the uh, uh, conquest is the battle of Beth Horon. The kings by now have confederated themselves under a guy who calls himself Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness, really. He's the king of Jerusalem. He gets defeated in this battle by stones of fire from heaven. In fact, the day isn't long enough for them to complete the route. So God, so, so Joshua asked the God to have the sun stand still, make the day longer so we can finish the job. The sun's commanded to stand still in order to give them time. The kings, by the way, subsequently run and hide in a cave and are dealt with later. And this will complete the southern strategy and the rest of the campaign is mop up. But let's get back to this sun standing still. A lot of people are upset by that. In fact, the more you know about science and, and our solar system, the more troublesome that is. You, can't, you tend to visualize the, the earth stopping, the inertia, you, 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 just can't, it just, you can't visualize it. Let's, back, let's realize, first of all, by the way, that this, the earth does not have to stop spinning to have the day longer. A change in precession would accomplish th th that, apparently. But one thing, you, as you start studying this, you discover some interesting things. All ancient calendars, I can give you 14 of them, were originally based on 360 day years. All ancient calendars change after 701 BC for some unexplained reason. Another thing you'll notice if you do your homework is the planet Mars was terrified, just terrified the ancient cultures. The ancient cultures worshipped Mars. He was called the god of war. That still occurs in our language. We speak of martial arts. The word is still there. It's saying the same thing. There is a hypothesis by some experts, some scientific experts, that there was a near passby in the orbit of Mars and the Earth. And let me get into that a little bit. The belief now by some is that Earth and Mars were originally on resonant orbits. Now, resonance is a concept you people in music know about. If you have a tuning fork on one side of the room and you hit it, a, a tuning fork of the same frequency and the other side of the room will pick up on that. They'll get in resonance. That's the way your radio tunes in certain stations. It makes your circuits resonant to the frequency of that particular station. So that's what they're... Con well, they've discovered, as they've learned about orbital mechanics uh, in, in our modern age, they've discovered orbits also influence each, influence each others and they can be in orbital relationships, uh, in uh, resonant relationships. And the belief is that Earth had a 360-day year, and Mars a 720. They were on, on, on uh, resonant orbits. However, they had a, the orbits were such they had near passbys uh, of each other every 108 years. And they would give, one would give energy to the other, depending which one's coming in or which one's going out. And it turns out, by modeling this, it accounts for catastrophic events on a number of occasions through history, at least seven of them. That's what put them on the trail of this thing. And uh, these energy transfers apparently stabilized finally in 701 BC. And a change in precession is all necessary. Let's take a look at this. Earth is on an orbit around the Sun, an elliptical orbit. And Mars is also on an elliptical orbit around the Sun. And uh, the res uh, the, it's a resonant orbit. Earth's on 360 days, Mars 720. In the spring, typically on March 20 or 21st, Every 108 years, there'll be a near passby. In the spring one, it hap happens after perihelion, after the closest part of the sun. And uh, uh, the one that's ahead loses a little energy. The Earth gains a little, Mars loses a little. The second passby, again, 108 years between these things, is in the fall, October 25th. This time, Mars is coming from the outside of aphelion, that is the furthest from the sun. It passes behind the Earth causing the Earth to lose some energy, Mars to pick up some energy, sort of a slingshot effect, sort of. And so uh, what this causes then, this, th these transfers occur 
every time, every 108 years, some amount, some add, some le less. And this has all been modeled, by the way, to some extent, uh, a de a, quite a detailed extent. When they finally stabilize, the Earth is no longer 360 days, it's 365 and a quarter days. Mars is no longer 720, it's now 687. But that means the calendars on the Earth need adjustment. The Romans, of course, add four and a quarter, four, uh, uh, five and a quarter days. Uh, other calendars do it slightly differently. The, the Hebrew ones do. Are really, they, add, uh, they add a month, seven times every 19 years, a very weird thing. And all the rabbis have books. They expect, why did Hezekiah do it that way? And uh, they don't explain, why did he have to do anything at all? Why did it have to change? They don't talk about that. Well, this, this has been very detailed. It makes some very interesting reading. But um, and, and it sounds like just a conjecture, except thanks to Jonathan Swift, it seems to be substantiated. And uh, let's back up a little and talk about early telescope technology. 1610 is when Galileo invented the telescope and discovered the four moons of Jupiter and the Saturn's rings, pretty obvious. In about 1781, Herschel has a better telescope by then. He discovers Uranus. 1787, he, with a, he finds two moons of Uranus. 1789, two more moons of Uranus. And 1846, Levier uh, discovers Neptune and one of its moons. It's in 1877 when Asaph Hall, with a brand new telescope at the U.S. Naval Observatory, discovers the two moons of Mars and makes astronomical history. They didn't know it had two moons. The reason they didn't, Deimos has, uh, it's, uh, one's, uh, they're very, very small. One is only eight miles in diameter and it's almost black. It has a reflectivity or albedo of only 3%. And uh, what's strange about this is that uh, the, the small one is going backwards. It's the only one that goes backwards in the entire solar system. And uh, you say, okay, so what? So you got, the, so you got these, they, uh, by the way, they, they mean, it means fear and panic in Greek, by the way. Appropriate for the God, you know, the God of War. But anyway, most of you know Gulliver's Travels, writing by Jonathan Swift. He, he lived between 1667 and 1745. And in 1726, he wrote Gulliver's Travels. Um, there are several voyages of Gulliver in his books. We all know the Lilliputes, the little people. That's the one that makes the cute little movies and stuff. By the way, these things were intended as political satire, not children's stories. Through the years, they've become popular children's stories. But it, in his third voyage of, of Gulliver, he's said to go to a place called Laputa where the astronomers there brag that they know about the two moons of Mars and the astronomers in London don't. And they go on to talk about the size, the revolution, and the orbits of the two moons of Mars. Within a 20% accuracy, by the way. You say, well, so what? Well, the problem is this. Jonathan Swift published Gulliver's Travels in 1726, 151 years before they were discovered by astronomers. Now, how do you explain that? Well, one conjecture is, well, he was just lucky. I don't think so. They're within tw the, the, the numbers are in, in his little story, and, and uh, very, uh, surprisingly, uh, within 20%. And one, the fact that one's going backwards is, is, is astonishing. Well, how, would he, how would he guess that? So the other possibility is that did he, did, he, did he guess it? I don't think so. Did he really know that? I don't think so. He knew Herschel. These people knew each other. And the astronomy world didn't know there were two moons of Mars. And I don't think Jonathan Swift did either. I suspect he drew on some legends to color and embroider his political satire. That's really it's, that's all going. What he didn't realize is that the things he was drawing upon were eyewitness accounts. And in order to see the two moons of Mars, Mars would have to be close enough to the Earth to see with a naked eye the two moons of Mars. And so this is a strange corroboration of this theory, a long day. Let's go back to Joshua. There's a third of a million men at Beth Horon. On October 25th of 1404 B.C., Mars is on a polar pass at only 70,000 miles from the Earth. It appears to rise 50 times the size of the moon. There are severe earthquakes and land tides. By the way, do you know that we know there's lotion tides. Did you know there are land tides? They're only about an inch, so you don't notice them, but they're there. They can be measured. Anyway, here we have severe earthquakes and land tides. And uh, there's a polar shift of about 5 degrees, which would lengthen the day. And meteors follow about 2 to 3 hours later at about 30,000 miles an hour. And the meteors are amazing because they hit only Israel's enemies. I want you to think about that. God put them in orbit whenever, but in such a way as to anticipate the enemies of Israel to act, they act as you know, like fire from heaven and wipe out Israel's enemies. Bizarre. 
What's interesting is that this legend of the long day isn't just in the Bible. We're indebted to Emanuel Velikovsky who discovered the legends in China of the long night about the same time. The long night of China. So it's, uh, these things are... But the campaign, of course, in the south we have the various treaty... They had a treaty with the Gibeonites, the Battle of the Beth-Horn and all that. And then there's some quick surprise attacks they get into in the south. Uh, in the north we have uh, Hazard's Alliance, a slower guerrilla war going up up there. But in any case, they, uh, before, uh, before the thing's over, they uh, conquer the land. The book of Joshua has also been contrasted with the book of Ephesians, a victorious cr uh, Christian living. In Joshua, we have Israel. In Ephesians, we have the church. In Joshua, they're entering and possessing. In Ephesians, we are to enter and possess our possession. In uh, Joshua, there's an earthly inheritance. In Ephesians, speaks of our heavenly inheritance. Joshua, it's given in Abraham. Of course, in Ephesians, it's given in Christ. Each is opened by a divinely appointed leader. Each is given grace and received by faith. Each uh, has a sphere of uh, striking divine revelations in both books. So there's, it, uh, uh, Alan Redpath has made a, done a, his, done a, a book called Victorious Christian Living. He contrasts the two books as, as parallels. Each is a scene of warfare and conflict. Ephesians, of course, has Ephesians 6, our armor of God. It, we are also in a warfare, a spiritual warfare. So that's interesting. But there's another comparison I want to tell you frankly up front, I can't find anyone that agrees with me. And I don't mean they disagree with me, but I can't find any commentary that has, highlights the fact that Joshua is a model of the book of Revelation. First of all, Joshua is Yehoshua. It's the name of Jesus on, on, on the book. Yehoshua is a variant, in effect, of Yeshua. In each book, you've got a military commander dispossessing the land of its usurpers. In Joshua, it's the land of Canaan. In Revelation, it's the planet Earth. In each case, it's a seven-year campaign. And it's against seven of an original ten nations in each case. What's strange as you study Jericho, the Torah is ignored in Jericho. They're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath? That's ignored in Jericho. In the Torah it says the Levites are not to go to war. They lead the procession in Jericho. And I could go on and on. And it's interesting, Joshua first sends in two witnesses. What did they accomplish? Not battle plan intelligence. They got Rahab saved. Who, becomes on the, who gets on the family tree of, of David, by the way. And there's seven trumpet events. They keep silent until the seventh deal here. It's interesting, when you get to Revelation chapter 8, before the trumpet judgments, there's silence in heaven for half an hour. You've got the same echoing, the same structure here. It gets, goes more than that. In Joshua, the enemies are confederated under a leader in Jerusalem, Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness. Of course, in Revelation, you have the Antichrist. And... Uh, they're ultimately defeated with hailstones of fire in heaven in both cases, with signs in the sun and the moon and so forth. And in both cases, the, kid, the kings hide in caves. In fact, in Revelation 6, rocks fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. The parallel, once you see a little of it, when you study Joshua and study Revelation, you'll be startled with how apparently, deliberately, structurally parallel the two books are. Well, after the conquest of the land, of course, they divide the land. The tribes are allocated their portions by casting lots half-tribe Manasseh and Gad and Reuben on the, uh, that are uh, east of the Jordan. And uh, then we have uh, all the rest of them being uh, Ephraim, of course. It becomes uh, idiomatic of the whole northern group. Dan is given a, a, a place that's west of Benjamin, but he can't hold it. And when Samson finally dies, who doesn't accomplish much, but a bunch of pranks, they can't hang on to it. So they go up north to a place called Laish. And so Dan really settles in the north part of the country, but don't, they don't really help much. Um, during the judges, Deborah upset because Dan doesn't even leave his ships. What's he doing in ships in the first place? And so Dan spins off from the commonwealth of Israel. It's one of the reasons why he's not mentioned in Revelation when the twelve tribes are listed, strangely enough. There's a whole thing about that we'll deal with when we get there. Then we got Benjamin and Judah in the south and Simeon to the south. So we have the various tribes. Now the Levites don't get an inheritance of land. They get 48 cities instead because the Lord's are their inheritance. Six of those cities are designated as cities of refuge. And uh, three, on the east, three east of the Jordan, three west of the Jordan. And we want to talk a little bit about cities of refuge. I said everything, well, every, all these strange things, they sound strange to our ears until we understand how they point to Jesus Christ. The idea of a city of refuge, see, they didn't have prisons. They didn't have a police force. If you killed somebody, the next of kin came after you. That was the, that was the way it worked. Well, suppose it was an accidental death, what we would call manslaughter. Well, if you accidentally killed someone, what you did immediately is you hightailed it to one of the cities of refuge. 
And if you could, if, if, I'm assuming now this is not premeditated murder, if it's a, what we call manslaughter. And what you did is, uh, you, if you could get to the city of refuge, you were secured there uh, in safety from the avenger of blood. The next of kin would be after you, but if, you're in, if you can uh, take refuge in the city of refuge, if you convince the city fathers this, this was a, a manslaughter thing, as long as you're in the city, you're safe. If you left the city, you're fair game. That's why it's called a city refuge. And this situation stayed as it was until the high priest down in Jerusalem died. Now you'll look at most commentaries, they'll say this guy, you know, just a quaint tribal custom here. But wait a minute, what's, this guy, what's the high priest got to do with the situation, one way or the other? You follow me? It's a, little, a strange situation. Well, let's, take a, let's analyze this a little bit, um, see if it applies to us. Let's talk about the crucifixion of Christ. Was it premeditated murder or was it manslaughter? From God's point of view, it was premeditated. He was foreordained before the foundation. It was God's, it was by His determinate counsel and so forth. From our point of view, what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them for what? No, not what we do. So we can use that and say, okay, this is at least, man from our point of view, it's, man it's manslaughter, not premeditator. Okay, so uh, the next question is, is where is our city of refuge? It's in Jesus Christ, of course. For how long is that stay? Until the high priest died. Who's our high priest? When did he die? Right then. So you can, you can, you, I'll let you, if you see that, great. Uh, uh, that's, um, there's another little quaint thing that deserves comment, and that's the daughters of Zelophehad. When Moses was establishing the laws of inheritance, a guy by the name of Zelophehad came to Moses and said, I got a problem. I only have, f I have five daughters, no sons. How are they going to inherit? Moses does the right thing. He goes to the Lord. The Lord tells, says, Make an exception. So there's an exception written in the Torah for the daughters of Zelophehad. And uh, on the rules, of, if, a, if a man has no sons and the daughters marry within the tribe, the, the uh, uh, inheritance will flow through to her husband. You follow me? That's what it basically says. It was requested in, by Moses in Numbers 27. And when you get to the land, and Joshua's laying out the land here, these five daughters come and say, by the way, check the records, read the fine print. We got an exception. Joshua does, and sure enough, you do. And that's in, John, uh, that's in Joshua 17. What most people who read this don't understand is how this worked. What happened was, if the do he had no sons, when the daughters married, the father of the bride adopted the husband as his son by adoption. And you'll find that in Ezra 2 and Nehemiah 7 and a number of other places. It's amazing how you can go through most commentators, and I can find any that really understand. They say this is just a quaint tribal custom. They don't, they don't attach any significance to this uh, theologically. Every detail in the Bible is there by deliberate design. That's my challenge to you. Check it out. It turns out the claims of Christ hang on this. This anticipates the lineage of Christ because there's a blood curse on the line of Joseph, but Jesus is not a son of Joseph. He's, a, he's just the legal father of Jesus. He's, that's why you have a virgin birth. He's born of Mary. Mary's father was Heli. She was the only, she, she had no brothers. When Mary marries Joseph, Heli adopts Joseph as his son. And that's how the line of, that's, when you go to Matthew, Matthew has the Jewish line from Abraham down through Joseph to Christ. Luke, being a doctor and interested in his humanity, starts at Adam, goes all the way from, from Adam to Abraham. From Abraham to David, they're identical. But at David, Luke takes a left turn and goes through a sec the second surviving son of Bathsheba, not the first one, which was Solomon, and down through Mary. And uh, so the point is, uh, Jesus is of the house and lineage of David, but those are two different lines. So we'll get into that when we get to the book of Luke. But all this hangs on the daughters of Zelophehad, this quaint little strange thing in the Torah. All these little rules you find, one way or another, will point to Jesus Christ. The book of Judges follows, and this is a very dismal book. The 450 years following the conquest, the next generation blow it again and again and again. They don't follow through. There are 400 year segments of, of uh, the nation's history. From the birth of Adam to the death of Joseph is about 400 years. Death of Joseph to Exodus is about 400 years. Exodus to the monarchy is about 400 years. So these are just horseback kind of numbers. And from the monarchy to the exile is also about 400 years. So these are just a rough feeling for the thing. But the book of Judges is a record of occasional deliverers rather than a succession of governors. It was probably written by Samuel before the accession of David. And the whole pattern in Judges is dismal. They sin, 
and they get oppressed by their, their, the indigenous tribes, and then they, they repent, and a deliverer comes and gives them some relief, but then they fall right back into it. The recurring phrase in the book of Judges is, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That doesn't sound too insidious on its own. You need to realize where it, where it stands. It's a scathing indictment. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. This is value relativism. And it led to chaos. The only person that decides what's right and wrong is God. And you're right or wrong if you're conformed to God's rules or you're not. And uh, so that's really the repeated refrain all the way through the book of Judges. And uh, there is a, a uh, this is the cost of compromise. See, another generation arose. And they were unwilling to help the rest. They were living among idolaters and they became contaminated with the idolatry. God had told them to wipe out every man, woman, and child of certain tribes because there were Nephilim among them. And they didn't do that. They made peace with them. And if you study the book of Judges, you'll discover their failures are up in the Golan Heights, up in Bashan. They're also in the core middle area. And they're also down in the Gaza Strip. And when you, look, when you do it, study it by a, a geographic, you'll see it's exactly the same thing today. Those places where they didn't deal with it back then, they're now suffering for it. And uh, interesting, demons are territorial. And of course the surrounding nations around, uh, I'm just summarizing the, the, the whole ju judges thing, the surrounding nations exploited their degeneracy. They had incomplete mastery, they made in inappropriate military alliances, they intermarried with these uh, pagan groups, and they had, that led to apostasy and idolatry. And uh, God occasionally intervenes, and they interrupted their sordid slide into failure. That book of Judges is a grim one. A lot of lessons. There are six servitudes. These are not accidents. They're brought about by God as punishments. And the privileges are not a license. Privileges are not a license to sin. And there's a pattern all through the book of Judges. They sin, they suffer, they repent, and then they're delivered. And they started well, but they finished dismally. They were without a king. God was supposed to be their king. But everyone did what was right in their own eyes. What you also notice is the degradation of the role of woman. Deborah was a military commander early in the book. Jephthah gets set aside for some uh, silly reasons, and then the concubine gets uh, 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 raped and killed in, the, the, in that dismal thing near the end. There's a, there are six servitudes. Um, the book of, the, uh, in the book of Judges, Mesopotamia, there was a liver of Athaniel, then the Moabites had a, a place for time, who delivers them. Then the Kenites and Deborah uh, delivers them from them. The Midianites, and you have the famous Gideon thing. And Jephthah and Ammonites, the Philistines. There's six of these. They add up to 111 years out of the total calendar time in which they are in servitude. I'm going to come back to that later. That's what, in a summary, I'll show you. It turns out that the history of Israel is always in 490-year segments. From Abraham to the Exodus is a, uh, uh, is a period of time. That pr the promise was 75 years before uh, we have... Uh, um, and uh, we get to the Exodus, so you got a total of 505 years. But of those years, 15 years, Ishmael was the usurper. When you subtract the 15 from 505, you get 490. Okay, well, so what? Well, Exodus to Temple turns out to be uh, uh, 601 years, 594 from 1 Kings 6 on, and then completed um, in 1 Kings uh, 6, uh, verse 38. So you got seven there. So anyway, you got the net of it, you got 601 years there, but you've got these servitudes between Exodus and the Temple of 111. They put them all in here. There's 111 of those. So again, you got 490 years. You're going to discover later that Israel is always, is always 490 years if you subtract the time that they are um, uh, uh, out of the land. And uh, we're, in a, we're in that parenthesis before the final seven years to make up the final 490. So we'll get to that later. There's a sordid chapter in uh, that ends the book of Judges. The Levite and his concubine. There's this Levite. He happens to be geographically in the tribe of Benjamin. But he travels. He's traveling to repair his marriage. He's unable to find safe lodging. So he's out on the street, out on the street at night. His, cape, his concubine is raped and left for dead. In fact, left dead. And uh, he's so upset, he cuts her in 12 parts and sends it to the 12 tribes of Israel. The tribes of, are absolutely shocked at the Benjamites. So the outraged tribes, it becomes a big cause celeb, and they attack the Benjamites, only to wake up to the reality they almost eliminate the tribe of Benjamin. The pendulum swings the other way. They all pitch in. There's only 600 left of the Benjamites. 
So they all pitch in to get brides for the remaining Benjamites to, to save this, the, the enduring endurance of the, tri- of, the, of the tribe of Benjamin. And so all the tribes assist in getting brides for these 600. So strange, strange, but it's a, a, if nothing else, describes the, the sad state of affairs in Israel. But uh, not, let's not leave it there. Let's have our dessert and get into the book of Ruth. Little book, the romance of redemption. It opens up in the days where the judges ruled. So this is not period. It's the ultimate love story that emerge, emerges out of this mess. At the literary level, it is widely venerated in colleges, just as an element of literature, apart from the biblical uh, implications. At the prophetic and personal level, it's a, a, a incredible gem. It has prophecy in it and also has personal implications for each of us. Strangely enough, even though it's in the Old Testament and the church is not visible in the Old Testament, this is one of the most significant books of the Old Testament regarding the church. And I'll show you why. One of the things it includes as part of the story is the role of this strange thing that in Hebrew they call the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. What is he? What does he do? What's that all about? And I'm going to suggest to you that this book is an essential prerequisite before you study Revelation chapter 5. You won't understand what's going on unless you really understand the book of Ruth. A little background. In the genealogies of the Bible, the tenth man is always significant. From Adam to Noah, we talked about that before. From Shem to Abraham is obviously significant. From Isaac to Boaz, he turns out to be the tenth uh, again. And so he turns out to be a very significant guy. He's going to be a type or a foreshadowing in a sense of Jesus Christ. And so the tenth man is always important. Now, the book of Ruth, the first chapter is about love's resolve, where Ruth cleaves to her mother-in-law, Naomi. Second chapter is love's response, where she then gleans on behalf of her mother-in-law because they're destitute there in Bethlehem. And then we have love's request. Out of this comes an opportunity. And there's this very misunderstood scene in the threshing floor we'll, we'll get to. And then there's a climactic scene which has some surprises for everyone in chapter 4. The redemption of both the land and the bride, and we'll talk about that when we get there. Ruth, for chapter 1, the famine, there's famine in Bethlehem, so Naomi and her husband Elimelech and their two sons, Malan and Kilian, go to Moab because things are better there. And in Moab, these two sons take up Moabite daughters as, as wives. And uh, Elimelech dies, leaving Naomi as a widow, and her two sons also die. Rather weird names, unhealthy and puny, apparently, is what the names mean. Um, speaks for itself, I guess. Um, Naomi's name means pleasant, and I'm going to suggest it means pleasant land, because she's going to turn out to be, in a sense, a type of Israel. But she's in Moab. She's in exile. And she's destitute. But ten years have gone by. She now hears things are better in, back at home in Bethlehem. So she's going to go back home. And her two daughters-in-law want to go with her. That tells you a lot about Naomi. Two daughters-in-law would want to stick it out with her. She talks him out of it. And one of them, uh, Orpah, uh, ultimately does return to her own people. But Ruth refuses. She's obstinate. And she decides to stay with her mother-in-law, and her testimony is worth quoting. Ruth said to to Naomi, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also. If aught but death part thee and me. What a statement. And Naomi realizes she's resolute, so she yields and and she goes back. So they go back to Bethlehem. You have to learn, uh, one of the reasons the book's of value, you have to learn some laws. One of them is the law of gleaning. The rules were that if you had a piece of land, your reapers could go through once and only once. What they missed was left, was for the widows and orphans and destitute. That was called the law of gleaning. You'd go through once, but you weren't allowed to go back and skim it. That, that was what you inherently would miss belonged to the destitute. That's in Leviticus 19, Deuteronomy 24, several places. So Naomi and uh, Ruth are destitute. They're back in the land, but uh, trying to make it. And so Ruth, being uh, younger, goes to glean. And, uh, so they, and she happens upon the field of Boaz. I love that word, happens. Uh, you know what the rabbis say? They say coincidence is not a kosher word. Or the way we see it, there's no accidents in God's kingdom. It turns out she happens on the one field that's going to change the destiny of the world. Boaz, by the way, means in him is strength. And it's a very interesting name because one of the two pillars in the temple are named Boaz for some significant reasons. We'll get there later. 
He's introduced to Ruth by an unnamed servant. And I'm fascinated. We're going to discover, of course, Boaz in the, is in the role of the Lord of the Harvest. Ruth, of course, will end up becoming his Gentile bride. The unnamed servant is the one that introduces her to Boaz. And the Holy Spirit always is an unnamed servant. We went through that in Genesis, you may recall. Here it happens again. Jesus says, explains why. The Holy Spirit will never testify of himself. And when Boaz finds out that Ruth is there, he instructs, he, he tells her, if don't be in any other field, stay here. And I've, he instructs his young men not to touch her and also to drop handfuls on purpose. <laughs> in other words, to make sure there's plenty they miss that she can glean for, for herself and her mother-in-law. And so you begin to see there's uh, something going on here. Boaz will be, turn out to be the role of a goel. That's a Hebrew term meaning the kinsman redeemer. And he has some interesting, uh, you have to, to, do, to get into this, you have to understand the law of redemption. And uh, also the law of Leverite marriage. The two other laws you need. The law of redemption was that if a person had to sell his land, that is lease it in effect because he was destitute, the next of kin could come and redeem the land for the family if he chose to. But he had to be able, he had to be willing, and he had to be able to take, he had to take all the obligations of the, the lost guy to do that. So that's what the, the it, was a, it, was a, it was an option, an optional responsibility, so to speak, of uh, the law of redemption. The law of Leverite marriage is the one we talked about. That's where a guy, if a guy dies, his brother is supposed to take, if he can, take the woman to raise up seed for the, the, the dead brother. And so the, the Leverite, the, the, so the, that's what the Leverite marriage was. Anyway, um, so in, in chapter 2, by the way, when, when uh, uh, Ruth comes home with all this stuff, Naomi smells a fish here. What's going on? And she, when she finds out that Naomi's been in Boaz's land, she re Naomi realizes that Boaz is a kinsman. And she realizes here's an opportunity, not just for herself, but also for her daughter, who's been so faithful. And so she says, do it exactly as I instruct you. And you get to chapter, this all sets the stage for chapter 3, the famous thrashing floor scene. So see, Naomi recognizes the opportunity for the redemption of her land that she wants, but also for a whole new life for Ruth. So she instructs Ruth on what to do. So in accordance with those instructions, Ruth approaches Boaz to fulfill the role of the Goel. And uh, what, he does, what, he, what, what happens, she tells her, see, the, the thrashing floor takes place on a saddleback where there's a wind all the time. And what you did at the end of the day, you took the grain that had been harvested and you threw it up into the wind and the, the good stuff, the heavy stuff, would fall in the pile downwind a little bit. The, the light stuff, the stuff you don't want, would fall further downwind. If you did this right, you ended up with two piles. The one closer in you'd bag for market and the one further down you'd burn to keep away vermin and so forth. But all this was done in the atmosphere of a carnival uh, a feast in the evening. So uh, when after the partying and, the, and all that, they um, would sleep. But the owner of the, of the material would sleep by the, and, and probably his key guys, would sleep by the grain so it wouldn't be stolen. And so it was an overnight uh, slumber party kind of thing. What um, Naomi tells Ruth to do, watch where he sleeps, and when it's all quiet, you go and sleep at his feet, and he'll tell you what to do. And so he does, in the middle of the night, he wakes up and hears Ruth, and he's shook. And she, she, when people read that, it sounds like she is propositioning him sexually. No, it's worse than that. She's asking him to do his kinsman's part. Uh, uh, spread your skirt over me is an expression. You need to understand the culture. Uh, hems were where the badge of authority resided. We think of, of authority as stripes on a sleeve or on a shoulder. In ancient Israel, it was on the border of your garment. That's when David cuts the hem of Saul's garment. He's cutting his genealogy away. Uh, the hem, when the woman, in the issue of blood, if she can touch the hem of Christ, her mind is, that's where his authority is. See, the hem's where the authority. When God speaks in Isaiah, God speaks of, of Israel, putting his skirt over Israel, putting his authority and protection over her. She asks him to put his skirt over her. People misunderstand that without the background. What she's asking him to do is marry her to raise up seed because he's a kinsman. And he says, and he's flattered. He's flattered and she does it. But unfortunately, there is someone, clo a closer kinsman, that he has to clear the way for first. And so she, she, wants, she wants him to fulfill the role of a goel. But there's a nearer kinsman in the way. And when you get through the story, see, by now you've got this love story going and she wants to be married. And when he says there's a nearer kinsman, you know, 
That's, that's a cloud. That's your plot problem. What's going to happen here? We'll get to that. And what he, what he does do, he gives her six measures of, of meal, barley, to take back to Naomi. You and I miss that, but Naomi, when she gets back, Naomi recognizes what that means. She says, that means he won't rest until this is resolved. See, the six days God worked and the seventh he rested, there's six, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a code, a code that Naomi picks up and understands when she gets home. So that leads to chapter 4, the big deal. Boaz confronts this guy that's the nearer kinsman. And Naomi has a property, uh, land, and, he, and uh, looking for someone to redeem it. He says, I'll redeem it. See, at this point, by the way, if you get in the real picture here, you've got a picture, you know, um, Boaz is sort of a Charlton Heston or a Harrison Ford kind of guy. The nearer kinsman is probably, what, Danny DeVita or something, see? Um, and he said, I'm willing to do it. Boaz says, wait a minute, uh, whoever takes that has to take all the obligation, you'd have to take Ruth as a bride. Well, he can't do that because it'll mar his own inheritance, so he passes. And he passes by giving, uh, uh, the symbol of his passing is to give, take a shoe and give it to, to Boaz. And of course, to him it's a disgrace, but to Boaz it's a marriage license. And so he, that's, that's the big win, because Boaz now, the road is clear for him to take Ruth as a bride. And so the, the guy yields his shoe to re relieve the obligation. Boaz steps up. He purchases the land for Naomi, and he purchases, that's the word used, Ruth as a bride, a Gentile bride. She's a Moabitess, right? Do you, see, do you see the symbolism starting to unfold here? You haven't seen the half of it. Okay. At the big celebration where Ruth and, and uh, Bo uh, Boaz are being married, Somebody says, may your house be like Perez. Now, if you don't know your story, it sounds like a toast. Isn't that great? But if you've read Genesis 38, you know what a sordid thing the birth of Perez was. That's where Tamar gets Judah to, un uh, un uh, uh, un uh, not realizing it, have incest with her to have a child. Remember that whole thing. And uh, uh, Perez is the illegitimate son of Tamar. Here they may your house be like Perez. You, if that, someone said that to you, you'd say, same to you, fella, you know. No, it's actually a strange prophecy buried in Ruth here. Let thy house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, the seed of which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. You need to know in Deuteronomy 23, it says, A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation shall he not enter to the Lord. In other words, it takes generation, ten generations to purge the illegitimacy, if you will. Well, if you go through here and you see the Perez, Hezron, Ram, Abinadab, Nashon, Solomon, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and David. Uh, you've got ten generations. In fact, you may recall that Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and David were encrypted in Genesis 38 behind the text. We looked at that then. But we have here um, the tenth generation after Perez is David. So here we have a prophecy in the book of Ruth. This is in the time of Judges of David being the king. Second time this comes up. It came up in Genesis 38, but it also comes up here. And uh, this is in the time of the judges. Interesting little thing. Now there's more to it. The Goel Kinsman Redeemer course, the kinsman had to, be a, he had to be a kinsman. He had to be able to perform. He has to be willing to perform. Those are two different things. And he has to be, assume all the obligations. And Jesus Christ is our kinsman. He became man and dwelt among us. He has to be able to perform. He could perform because he's sinless on our behalf. He had to be willing, and he was. He loved us that much. And he had to assume all of our obligations, which he did. So that's why this thing is fitting the model here. Boaz is the Lord of the harvest. He's the kinsman redeemer. What's Naomi? She's Israel. Because of his redemption, Israel's returned to the land, to her land. And Ruth, of course, is the Gentile bride. You wonder, how can Boaz, a good, self-respecting Israeli leader, take on a Gentile bride? You have to know who Boaz's mother was. His mother was Rahab, the harlot of Jericho. So no wonder he had to see what the law could not do, grace can. Some other observations. In order to bring Ruth to Naomi, Naomi had to be exiled from her land. Now that's kind of interesting. Think that through. What the law could not do, grace did. It was illegal to marry a Moabite. But uh, our kinsman redeemer did. And Ruth does not replace Naomi. They have different destinies. Ruth learns of Boaz's ways through Naomi, but Naomi meets Boaz through Ruth. Think that one through. And no matter how much Boaz loved Ruth, he had to wait for her move. Jesus is waiting for your move. Do you receive him? Do you accept him? 
so that he can be your kinsman redeemer? It's interesting that Boaz, not Ruth, confronts the nearer kinsman. The law required the, 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 the estranged girl to confront the nearer kinsman. No, Boaz did it for her, and he does it for us. He makes intercession for us. It's interesting how much the model fits, and it's also interesting how much the model is twisted to fit the real reality we have. Some final remarks. The book of Ruth turns out to always be read at the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Shavuot. How interesting. The Feast of Shavuot was the birth of the church, and the book of Ruth, in a sense, anticipates the church. And you can't really understand what's going on in Revelation chapter 5, where the Lamb takes the title deed of the earth and takes possession of that which He purchased, unless you understand these things in the book of Ruth. You and I are beneficiaries of a love story that was written in blood on a wooden cross erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. The book of Ruth profiles that for us. Panorama of history. Next time we're going to get into David and the monarchy. The monarchy will be 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. We're going to include, conclude the reign of Saul and the Davidic dynasty, David, Solomon, the temple. That's our, ambi- that's our task for hour number seven. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. Judges, dismal story, but all of them full of lessons in terms of understanding God's total plan, also lessons for us personally. The failures are lessons of failure, and we need to understand that. And what the remedies for failure are, we need to understand that. We are in a warfare, just like Joshua was, spiritual warfare. That's what Ephesians 6 is all about. So the, the very, very pregnant period that we've gone through here. But there's no little book that'll charm you more than if you dig into the book of Ruth. Every t- I've taught it probably a hundred times, and every time I go through it, I see another insight. It's inexhaustible. So is the Gospel of John have that very uh, conspicuous characteristic. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just thank you for your word. We're, we stand in awe of your word and the extremes you've gone to that we might have your illumination. We thank you, Father, for these little treasures you've hidden around every corner. But we do pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would illuminate all of this to put it in perspective for our lives, that we might understand what it is you would have of us in the days that remain. We do pray, Father, that you would oh, just reignite in each of us a new passion, a new hunger for your word, that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, and that we might be more fruitful stewards of the opportunities before us. We do pray, Father, that you just open our hearts and lives to your word. As we commit ourselves into your hands, without any reservation, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.